Séminaire en anglais Ouais, du coup je Uh, so I uh, will present uh, some of the work that we do uh, along a multi-university research initiative um, that aims at uh, demonstrating uh, multiphysics control of uh, gas acetyl atomization. And I will mostly talk about uh, the experimental work that we conduct at the University of Washington uh, with uh, Alberto Aliceda and uh, my PhD student and another uh, uh, postdoc. So, um, liquid uh, uh, spray are, of course, uh, very critical for many processes. Uh, and I've selected uh, just uh, two as an example where um, having real-time feedback control could uh, increase the efficiency of those uh, process uh, very much. You have on the left here uh, combustion. On, on the right, you have a coating by atomizing a, a liquid metal. Um, <coughs> and before diving into the atomization, uh, let's first uh, step back a little and see uh, what are the processes that happen when you break, uh, when you have a gas, uh, a gas flow that breaks uh, a single drop here. So the, the relevant uh, um, adimensional parameter for this is what is called the Weber number. It compares the stresses applied by the gas to the surface tension of the liquid. And so it takes this form in this simple uh, case where you have the square of the velocity, the diameter of the drop, and the surface tension here. There's like a lot of different um, regime depending on the value of this uh, Weber number. And today I will only talk about two of them that are relevant for the spray I will be considering. Uh, first, you are, so those two. So First, for the lower range of Weber number, so for the for in our case, for the low value of the gas speed, uh, you have what is called back breakup or membrane breakup, where your drop is flattened out by the gas jet, or the, the gas flow, and the gas will then blow a bag in, in, in the liquid, uh, which will expand, and then it will reach a, a critical thickness, and it will break. The film of the bag is going to produce very tiny drops, while the rim here uh, produces larger drops. You have here some uh, images from the spray, the, the, sp the spray we study at UW, and I will talk more about it later. You see here on those two successive snapshots uh, a bag expanding. And here you have this bag that just broke. You don't really see the tiny drops because they're, they're a bit too small here uh, for the resolution of the camera, but you see very clearly this string of drops that is the remnant of, of, the, of the rim here. When you increase the, the gas speed, uh, so the Weber number, um, as soon as you flatten your drop, uh, the drop is going to experience a relative or type instability. This will produce a clear wavelength and that will break the drops into uh, smaller drops. And the scenario in the, in the spray is that you have those, those two fluids that are flowing together at different speed. So you will have uh, waves that are going to be created by kelvin helmholtz type uh, instabilities. They are going to be elongated in, into filaments, and then those filaments are going to break along this relative or type instability. This is often referred to as fiber type atomization, and it produces very fine uh, drops and with a bit less size difference than with uh, the back breakup where you have the rims that produce much larger drops. So uh, atomization has been studied in great details in the past and you can find many phase diagrams of the modes of atomization and I'm just showing you that to tell you where we are gonna evolve today. Uh, so um, I am going to fix the liquid injection at a quite slow rate, so that we have laminar injection, a Reynolds number of around a thousand, and I will just change the, the gas speed, so increase the Weber number, and we'll move from the bag breakup type to the fiber type uh, atomization. And before I show you the experiment, uh, let me J'augmente la vitesse du gaz. 
Oui, oui, tu... N non, ça c'est le Renos liquide, pardon. Ah, d'accord, c'est le... Oui. Euh, le... Oui, oui, oui je, vais, je vais présenter plus en détail euh, l'expérience. Pas de problème. Uh, so yeah, first uh, a few results of uh, uh, two-fluid atomizer and uh, more precisely coaxial two-fluid atomizer where you have a, a stream of liquid that is surrounded by a gas coflow that is going to um, make this liquid jet suffer several instabilities and break it into droplets. Uh, so first, because of the velocity difference of your, of your two fluids, Uh, you tend to have a, a helical instability uh, where your liquid jet kind of flap around and people tend to, re to refer to that as flapping and um, recently um, a linear stability analysis combined with a Soros uh, experimental uh, measurements um, show uh, that this flapping frequency is governed of course by the the speed of both the liquid and the gas, but you can see that it also uh, um, depends on the boundary layer of the gas at the interface of the liquid, but also of the boundary layer of the liquid. Um, and well, typically when you increase the gas speed, you tend to increase this flapping frequency. At the same time, you have uh, another large scale parameter that is important, that is called the intact length. Uh, it's, uh, longitudinal extent of your spray where you still find a liquid that is connected to the exit of the atomizer uh, as pictured here. And you can see that this is of course a strongly decreasing function of uh, the gas speed. So you can look at this with the Weber number. Uh, and when you increase the amount of liquid that you put, uh, when you increase the liquid Reynolds number, you tend to have a, a longer extent of your, of your spray, right? For a fixed gas Reynolds number. So we have those two large scale parameters. We can see how this relates into, in terms of droplets produced in the far field of your spray. Um, so what people tend to look at is what is called the sauter mean diameter. It's the ratio of the third moment of the droplet to the sec uh, droplet side to its second moment. And it's the diameter that is relevant of the, atomization, uh, the evaporation characteristic of your spray. And in the early 2000, um, There's a model that has been developed based on this uh, relay Taylor instability, breaking the, the, the ligament into drops, and it gives you this strong decrease of the droplet uh, sort of mean diameter as a function of the, of the gas speed. Uh, and in the late 2000, this was extended to the case of uh, viscous fluid, and what you see is that, of course, this diameter decreases strongly with the gas speed, but there's also a strong dependence with the... Um, gas boundary layer at the interface of the liquid, which you see here and there. So the goal of our project is to uh, demonstrate the multiphysics control of uh, this atomization. Uh, and uh, to do so, we've uh, designed and built a, a canonical two-fluid atomizer that is open source and made uh, available to the community, both for experimental investigation, but also for numerical simulation. And uh, what we, our approach is to do several open loop investigation, uh, aiming at developing a data-driven reduced order model to implement real-time uh, feedback control. There are several uh, um, control strategies that we investigate. Uh, first, um, harmonic forcing of the, of the flow rate, both of the liquid and of the gas. And uh, in that, uh, you, we, the gas is mostly uh, longitudinal, it's a longitudinal coflow, but you can also impart uh, azimuthal momentum in this spray, you can swirl it. And so we also investigate uh, this. Uh, we're also interested in um, putting electric charge in the liquid to change the uh, breakup instability. And then also you have a liquid that become charged and you can develop the, an electric field in the far field and uh, change the spatial temporal distribution of your droplet. And finally, we're also interested in uh, acoustic field actuation. And sorry, today I will mostly talk about the, the effect of the swirl ratio, whether steady or modulated. And I will talk very briefly on how you can move your droplets around using uh, an electric field. So of course, 
such control have been investigated in the past, uh, whether it's acoustic or uh, swirling the jet. Um, and you also have a, a large community that study electrospray where you, you know, quite different situation where you just have a, a needle with liquid and you put this needle to higher electrical potential and this produces all those droplets by itself without air. Uh, so what we want to do is air, uh, air assisted atomization that is modulated by the electric field. So it's a bit of a different approach here. So um, here is uh, a sketch of an uh, atomizer again. Uh, and I will come back into more detail on the sum of it and how the controls are implemented. Um, <coughs> as I was saying earlier, there's uh, a bunch of dimensional parameters that are relevant for the uh, breakup processes. But today, uh, we are fixing the liquid injection rate to have a liquid runoff of around 1,000. We're not changing the fluid's properties. We'll just increase the gas speed so I will only talk in terms of uh, momentum ratio, which is more likely a, a dynamic pressure ratio with uh, density times the square of the velocity of the gas with the same for, for the liquid. And we'll go around a, a wide range of that. And we will always be in scenario where there's very li little liquid uh, compared to li little liquid momentum compared to the gas momentum, which is represented by this ma liquid mass loading. So it's the gas is uh, driving the, the instability on the breakup here. So here is two movies, uh, one in the lowest range of speeds that we consider today, one in the intermediate one. So if you look here at the on the left first, you indeed see the flapping of the jet quite clearly, and you see those bags that are being created, expanding, and immediately break. And you see that you have big lumps of fluid, uh, and, uh, but also tiny drops due to the bags. And this is quite close to the, to the nozzle. Uh, it's only like a few gas diameter downstream. So we're still with the primary break, uh, primary breakup drops that will then be further broken up by the turbulence. Uh, and on the right, you can still see the flapping a little bit. Uh, it's harder to see because it's quicker. Uh, and you see that you, you produce a, a much finer spray with this fiber type regime. So very briefly, uh, we've characterized the gas jet using a uh, hot wire anemometry, uh, where we can measure the gas boundary layer. You see that, so this is translating the probe across the, the nozzle, where you go from the nozzle wall, uh, like this is the gap, then this is uh, the needle, and then it's again the gap and the nozzle wall. Uh, you can see that you have a double top hat distribution very close to the exit, and then later on you recover the property of a turbulent gas jet with a cell similar uh, Gaussian profile. So before diving into the, the control and the metrics that we typically look at the spray, uh, I want to chat a little bit on about the, the intact core of the jet like the very, very exit of the atomizer, which is a very dense region. And to probe it, uh, we don't get as much information with optical light. So what we do is we do X-ray radiography. Uh, and because it's very dense, once again, we, we need a very high en energy level in the X-ray. So we're lucky to have access to uh, a synchrotron at the advanced photo source of uh, Argonne National Lab in Chicago. And there, we do uh, two types of measurement. One that is um, kind of the gold standard uh, to measure uh, volume fraction in a multi-phase flow, which is called focus beam. So you take your X-ray produced by your synchrotron. You use a, a, a filters to have a purely monochromatic beam so that you can use BLM below and measure the attenuation of your X-ray and directly get the equivalent pass length of fluid that was traversed by your your beam, so it's integrated along the, the, the beam. And this is very point-like. The, the beam is very, uh, is very short, and we acquire that with a pin diode, so we can have very high uh, spatial uh, temporal resolution. So you get this kind of time signal of the length of fluid in across your beam. So once again, it's integrating across the spray. And then you can 
raster scan your experiment in front of your X-ray beam and get this kind of map, like the average or standard deviation or any other, or any moment of your uh, beam length. Um, another technique that we do that is often used most for qualitative measurement, observation of your spray, I would say, is what is called white beam. It's called white beam because you don't use uh, the filter, so your beam is polychromatic, so you can't use Bialamber directly and get the, the equivalent pass length. But it gives you a large field of view, so you can correlate structures spatially. You get this kind of images, and we, we record that with a high-speed camera, so we still get high uh, temporal resolution. Uh, and yeah, you have your collimated X-ray beam uh, that goes through your spray. It hits uh, a scintillator crystal that absorbs the X-ray, ray emit invisible light, and you record that with the high-speed camera. And we have to use a chopper wheel, else you can you can damage your experiment, and you will uh, produce a lot of heating on the crystal scintillator and change its property. So we get like. Uh, typically like 30 milliseconds of acquisition, uh, and we repeat that uh, a lot of time. So, yeah, as I said, this is done a lot to do observation of the spray, and here I, I show you a few a few things that we can we can see with it, and uh, for that I will very briefly introduce uh, what I call the swell ratio, which characterizes the azimuthal momentum that we, we put in the gas co-flow. So I, I will come back to that later, but yeah, basically this go between zero and one. When there it's zero, you have no only longitudinal momentum. When it's one, you have more. Um, so at very low momentum ratio, you can see very clearly the bag uh, forming and breaking on those two successive images. And you can see that also you have an intact liquid core. It's very corrugated on its surface. There's a lot of uh, length scale here. Um, what you can see also is uh, you have air entrapment in your, in your liquid core. So um, our scenario is that your Kelvin Helmholtz waves most of the time will expand into bags and filaments, but sometimes they will reattach and they will entrain air. And then those air bubbles are advected uh, in the spray and they are advected quite further downstream where you can find them in uh, liquid films, uh, filaments and droplets. And they must play a role in the, in the breakup mechanism as they induce a local uh, surface tension gradient. And so what becomes interesting is that when you increase your momentum ratio quite a bit, so when you get into higher gas Reynolds number, higher gas speed, uh, you don't have an intact core anymore. What you observe is that the center of your core is kind of hollow. You have something that looks like a, an upside down crown, where you only shed uh, filaments and drop on the circumference of your liquid core, but not in the middle. And um, this is uh, something that is highly dynamic, where when you, and that becomes very unstable when you put azimuthal momentum, you tend to produce de-wetting here, where your part of your liquid core detached from the liquid needle where it's injected, and, um, and you get this hole in your liquid core where the liquid flow around it, so you still find liquid downstream. But when you put even more azimuthal momentum, you detach uh, your liquid core on a large part of, uh, of your liquid needle, and you get something that is, yeah, is on one side of the needle, and then it can move later on. But this, of course, changed drastically the boundary layer of the gas at the interface with the liquid, and this must have large impact on the, the droplet size later on. So, to go into a bit more detail, I've been uh, a bit more quantitative on that. I've been working recently on trying to calibrate those white beam imaging image uh, using the the pin dial, the um, focus beam measurement that I presented to you before. So here, if you look at this image, uh, where this is just the intensity, you can still try to correct it to get 
a good estimate of the liquid length that was integrated along your X-ray beam. So you can take a profile here, for example, which is the, the blue one here, and the red one is another one where you, you, you take a measurement further downstream, but you still have overlap so that you can see uh, how robust your measurement is. And the dashed line here is the uh, is, um, focus beam measurement, and you can see that you have a pretty good agreement. So you can use that to uh, a posteriori calibrate uh, your measurement, and instead of looking at the movie of the just the intensity, you can get movies of uh, the instantaneous liquid length that is integrated along your X-ray beam. And those two are the movies that I've showed you before. They are much more uh, zoomed in than the previous one. There's the magnification is like 10 times higher, or the field of view is 10 times smaller, sorry. Uh, so yeah, at, at, low gas, uh, at low momentum ratio, you have something that is like it's an intact core, it's still quite, uh, you can still see a lot of uh, different length scale and a lot of things going on, but you have something way more dynamic, if, I, if you can call it that, at uh, higher uh, momentum ratio, where uh, in the video I've showed you before, this whole area was black, because all those filaments and drop being created obscure the light and make you think that you don't have any uh, that you have like an intact core here. So what we see, if you take this same movie, well, this same condition, but you put some swirl, uh, so you di divert half of your, of your flow rate into uh, the azimuthal momentum, you see that this crown of liquid is very unstable and tends to attach to one side of the other of the, of the needle. And what the red light here, which is drawing this plot here, is the center of mass of uh, your uh, liquid core in the transverse direction that we compute using the liquid length information. And you can see that you have something that looks bistable with uh, residence times that are long on one state and transitions that are pretty short compared to these times. So uh, we're still looking to in into more detail into that to understand the physics behind it. But thanks to the extra measurement, and sorry here the contrast is not great, but we can observe through the atomizer, so through the, the walls of the atomizer. So here uh, what you see is the liquid needle edges here. So this is in the gas nozzle. This darker area is the liquid. And what you see is that you have this region where gas penetrates inside your liquid needle. So our scenario is that this needle for the gas is like a, a backward facing step. And so you have a, a recirculation cavity here for the gas. And this tends to penetrate inside the liquid needle. So you have this recirculation cavity that block, that prevents the liquid from flowing here so that it's forced to be ejected only on one side of the needle. And you can characterize uh, uh, that a bit in more detail if you look at the um, center of mass uh, along time uh, and do the uh, priority density function. Uh, you can see if you fix the momentum ratio, increase the swell ratio, you go from no swell, you don't have this instability. You have this crown that is hollow and very interesting, but it's, it's stable. But when you increase the swell, when you put swell and increase it, you, you become bimodal with those two modes that get further and further away from zero, and the probability of being at zero is less and less. And you can see that at fixed momentum ratio, uh, this uh, ratio of probability increases when you increase the, the momentum ratio. So from those uh, quantitative measurements with the X-ray, we can draw a first uh, uh, phase diagram of the state of the liquid core. Uh, and what we show is that this is only in the parameter space with a ratio, momentum ratio. You have extra points here that I haven't presented, which are at varied uh, liquid uh, Reynolds number, up to around uh, 10,000. And the state of the liquid core is only governed by those two parameters. 
And so you have those four state intact core crown here, yeah, an intermediate one that I call a partial deweighting when you have those pockets, and then the unstable crown. And you see that when you put wheel, you need less momentum, you need less gas momentum to go to those higher energetic state. And uh, so now that we have this big picture of the what the liquid core look like uh, for different parameters, we will study the, the spray itself into more detail and see how the control affect uh, affect the spray. So we're going to come back to uh, optical imaging uh, because it's something that is more accessible that we can do in on the lab year round uh, while the synchrotron we can only go there a few times a year uh, so but we still can measure a lot of metrics on the on the optical imaging so if you take the movie I've shown you before and just average it through time you get this kind of maps intensity maps where the gray level relates to the probability of finding liquid at a certain location and we can do like transverse profile of this probability going further and further downstream, what you see is that the probability of finding liquid is, uh, is self-similar. Uh, it's uh, well fitted by a Gaussian. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is very convenient. We can, uh, we can get the standard deviation of this Gaussian, uh, fit that with a linear regression, and this get, uh, gets us a spray angle that is a bit more robust. Of course, it depends on what you fit. If you fit the standard deviation, twice the standard deviation, three times the standard deviation, you get angles that are bigger and bigger. But they all behave the same. Uh, and they all decrease very strongly with the momentum ratio. But what you can see here is that the intersection of all your regression, linear regression, is the same. Uh, and that, we can call it a virtual origin in analogy to a uh, turbulent jet and we can see how uh, it changed with the parameter. Uh, before, and we'll, we'll look at it in comparison with the uh, intact length that I have introduced before. Um, so let me just tell you how we measure it. We, we take those movie, we threshold uh, to detect this uh, intact core, and we measure instantaneously the in longitudinal extent of our liquid jet. And so we can look at the distribution of those uh, intact lengths, they tend to be uh, log normal with uh, an average that uh, decreases when you increase your momentum ratio, when you increase your gas speed, and, with, um, and they tend to become a bit wider when you increase this momentum ratio. So let's look at the average that, as I've shown in the introduction, decreases very drastically with the momentum ratio. And you see that you have a similar evolution, it's, it's not exactly the same, of the virtual origin. And what you see is that the virtual origin is uh, downstream of the nozzle at low momentum ratio. And when you increase the momentum ratio, it, mo it moves it, it, moves it uh, upstream so that it, it is inside the atomizer. Um, lastly, uh, we've been talking about the flapping frequency. Uh, you have the same movie than before, but sped up so that you can see more events. You also have uh, a comparison with a uh, numerical simulation done by the group of uh, Olivier Desjardins at Cornell, uh, who is working with us on this project. We, for both experiment and simulation, we measure it. We extract the flapping frequency the same way. We look at the sum of the pixel intensity in a half uh, cross line here. This gives us a time signal. We take the Fourier transform to obtain the power spectral density, and you have clear peaks. You extract the frequency of those peaks, and you see how this evolves with the momentum ratio. So first, you have a very good agreement between experiment and simulation. So this tells you that this is robust and not dependent on the experimental detail of the manufacturing. Uh, and you have a power law increase of an exponent of around 0.8 with the momentum ratio. Uh, this corresponds to an increase with the Reynolds number of 4.9. Um, we're looking into doing complementary measurement of the boundary layer of both the liquid and the gas to be able to compare this canonical in atomizer results with what I've showed you in the introduction uh, with uh, the study from uh, Delon et al. So, now that we have those four metrics, uh, 
uh, of the, the four large scale matrix of the near field of the spray. Uh, let me introduce the control and let's see how they affect the, the spray. So, uh, the way the gas in is introduced in the nozzle is through four inlets that are on axis so that the, the gas flow is accelerated along the, the cubic spline wall of the atomizer. So, you have a longitudinal gas co flow uh, that comes and disturbs this uh, liquid stream that is injected through this long uh, vertical duct. Uh, but you have also four separate inlets that are off axis in the same direction and that are going to impart azimuthal momentum in your gas co flow. When we put swirl, we keep the total flow rate constant so that the Reynolds number, the momentum ratio are the same. And we, the way we measure the swirl is by a swirl ratio that is very simple. It's just the, the ratio of the swirling flow rate to the ratio of the longitudinal flow rate. And this we've explored on a range from zero to one. We can have steady swirl, but we can also use uh, the valve, the, the electro valve that are on this uh, gas line to modulate it. When we modulate it, it's at very slow uh, frequency. The period is of around two seconds. It's much slower than the slowest time scale of the spray, that is the flapping frequency that is at the order of at least 100 hertz. But as I will show you later, you still have effect on the spray behavior. Um, then for the electric field, and I will talk about it towards the end of the presentation, this liquid needle is metallic, so you can connect it to a high negative potential. And you have on top of that uh, a ring that is flush with the exit of the atomizer that we connect to the ground so that we intensify the electric field at the exit of the no needle. And you have ultra pure water to mimic the property of fuel, for instance, uh, that get charged. And this change in stability and that I, w I won't be able to talk about it uh, for the sake of time today. But what I will be talking about is when you put two parallel plate in the far field, connecting to a high positive potential, you will have uh, an effective electric force on your droplets that is radially outward. So, uh, these are the four metrics that I've introduced uh, as a function of the momentum ratio. The red symbols are without swill, and then when you go to the square, to the triangle, you increase the amount of swill that you put. So what you see is that you increase the flapping frequency decrease the intact length, uh, of course increase the spreading angle and this is something that has been reported and that is expected and you increase it quite a bit and this tends to uh, move the virtual origin downstream so it's still within the atomizer but it's closer to the exit plan. And we can fix the momentum ratio and here we're only going to talk about the momentum ratio of 25 because the Momentum ratio of 5 is on the back breakup uh, scenario still, and with the swirl you cannot go between uh, back breakup to fiber type, so it's, it's a bit less trivial to describe. Uh, but we can come back later if you'd like. So the flapping frequency and the intact length are kind of monotonous uh, behavior with the swirl ratio, with like a linear increase and a somewhat linear decrease. Uh, and the spreading angle and the virtual origin are uh, as reported in the literature, you have almost no effect when you put a little bit of swirl, and then when you are above a, a critical swirl ratio, which is around 0 0.5, uh, you increase the spreading angle quite a bit, and this is a, um, also with a virtual origin that moves downstream quite a bit. And then it, it apparently tends to saturate, and we will measure the, the gas flow in a bit more detail to see how this relates in terms of uh, momentum, uh, azimuthal momentum ratio with uh, longitudinal momentum to, to see, uh, to understand this saturation a bit better. So, uh, what you can do now is also compare a steady swirl to um, a modulated swirl. So, once again, at a very slow frequency, and th those are measurements at average times, uh, what you see is that the effect you observe on these three metrics, the spray angle, the virtual origin, and the intact length, are the same but stressed. While uh, on the flapping frequency, instead of an increase, you have a decrease. 
so this is something that we need to uh, look at in a bit more detail and we started doing that by uh, going back to the synchrotron uh, over the summer and looking at the effect of the swell modulation on the on the spray core and so those are like the same image I showed you before with a fixed momentum ratio you increase your swell ratio so you go from your intact liquid core to your uh, upside down crone and what you see is that when you modulate the swell ratio uh, so this is just one instant but it over a lot of instants you have something that look neither like this one or this one. So we will look into that into more detail, but you can kind of guess that the flapping frequency is of course different uh, because you're destabilizing your liquid core quite a bit. So now that we've looked at the near field of the spray, uh, we will see how all those metrics relate in terms of the droplet being produced and advected in the far field and we will see how the controls affect those uh, droplets, so the droplet size and uh, their spatial uh, distribution and all. And we will move from the high speed imaging to uh, what is called a phase Doppler particle analysis or PDPA which is giving you the size and the velocity of the drop thanks to a Doppler shift in the crossing of uh, two laser beam. So let's first look uh, at some droplet size uh, uh, PDF. So this is at a fixed downstream distance. And when you move uh, from the dark blue along those colors here, you're moving from the center of the jet towards the edge. And this is for the low momentum ratio, uh, where you see this kind of change of slopes in the distribution that is due to the back breakup with the rim producing bigger drops. And what you see is that when you move towards the edge, you have less small drop and more large drops. On the contrary, for high momentum ratio, you have distribution that on a range here are uh, in this uh, semi-logarithmic plot, somewhat linear, uh, uh, roughly. Uh, so when you move from the edge to, uh, uh, fr sorry, from the center towards the edge, you first have not much change and then you, you start to decrease the number of large drops and you're cut off in terms of larger drops. So you, get, you tend to have smaller drops on the edge of your spray. So we can characterize that in a bit more detail if we look at the droplet distribution moment uh, going along those, uh, those profiles. So let's first look on the left at the arithmetic average droplet size. Uh, the blue plot here the, that looks like a parabola is exactly what I've showed you before. In a, the average size for the low momentum ratio is smaller on the center of the spray than on the edge. When you move further downstream, when you move along those colors here, uh, you get a parabola that is uh, flatter. So your small drops that were in the middle get advected radially and you get something that is starting to be a bit more homogeneous. There's still a, la a large spatial variation, but it's flatter. When you look at the higher momentum ratio, what you see is uh, something that is uh, the opposite, smaller drop on the edge and on the center, but what you see is that uh, there's almost no variation with looking at things further downstream, or very little. So uh, let's look at uh, the center line uh, and a fixed downstream distance and see how those droplet distribution evolve a bit more finely with the momentum ratio. So as I was saying before, for the lowest momentum ratio, you still have this change of slope that gets attenuated when you increase the momentum ratio because of the black breakup. And then you, you, you come, you get like, so you peak at small size and you get a, a strong exponential decrease and a, a cutoff in diameter that is towards smaller and smaller size when you increase the momentum ratio, when you have more gas momentum to break your spray. So uh, knowing that, we can <laughs> fix the momentum ratio, look at things the same way, and increase the swell ratio. And what you see is that your slope of your exponential gets steeper and steeper, and you tend to have smaller and smaller drop and less large drops, uh, and not, not any drop of larger size when you increase your, your swell ratio. So you're, you're increasing the your atomization efficiency in a way. 
uh, and you can see that this hold throughout the spray. So the field symbol are without swirl, the empty symbol are with swirl. When you move from blue to red, you're moving further downstream. What you see is that the empty symbol curve are almost shifted downward. So throughout your spray, you have smaller droplet size. Now let's compare the, st the steady swirl with the modulated swirl. So steady is uh, the empty symbols, and steady are the field symbols. Uh, what you see is that in the center, there's almost no difference. If you want to look at things in a bit more detail, you can look at higher moment of the droplet distribution, and here you see that you still decrease a bit uh, your droplet size overall. But mostly it's on the side that you get a smaller droplet size. So you, you tend to further decrease uh, the spatial variation of along your spray. So you get smaller droplet and less variation, less spatial variation. So for many applications, this is a better spray. We can we can look at things more finely with the PDPA. We have a, a, a time signal of the droplet size and of the droplet velocity. And here I'm just showing you a sliding average so that it doesn't hurt the eye too much. Uh, the upward pointing triangle is the velocity. The circle are the droplet size. They are, of course, out of phase. When you have higher velocity, you break your spray into finer drops that we've, we've seen so far. Uh, so your gas velocity is modulated because you modulated your total flow rate. When you are at the valley of the oscillation, uh, you have less instantaneous flow rate. When you are at the peak of the oscillation, you have more uh, flow rate. Um, so we can use the velocity information to phase average our droplet size distribution. And that's what we've done here on the right, where uh, the the phase phi equal to zero, the blue curve is at the peak of the oscillation when you have more momentum uh, and produce smaller droplets, and the red is at the at the valley of the oscillation. And the comparison is with the reference case with a swirl. What you see is that even when you have half the momentum ratio, the instantaneous momentum ratio, when you have the valley of the oscillation, you still produce slightly smaller drop. It's very similar, but you're slightly under it. And of course, when you have more momentum ratio, you have a very strong uh, exponential decay. But so what we've showed is that through time and along space, you have finer droplets. So uh, throughout, you have much uh, finer droplets overall with uh, the oscillating swirl. So uh, let's look further at how we can modify the spatial distribution of your drops by uh, using an electric field in the far field of your spray to move your droplets around. So uh, this is still a bit preliminary. We need to complement that by a further measurement, uh, further downstream, because what I'm going to show you is measurement of the very uh, near field area where your droplet just got produced, and you see how the electric field already starts to act on them. So what we do is uh, 2D tracking on the images, so 2D tracking of the droplet, you see an example, a subset of your tracks here, and you can see already that some seem to get deviated from what you would expect. And uh, from that, uh, we have tracks that are differentiable. We can look at the statistics of the position, velocity, and acceleration of your droplet. So if you first look at the position, you don't see much, because you're very zoomed in to have a high spatial resolution and detect small drops. So of course, in about two gas diameter, the spreading, if you look in detail, you can see a little bit of it, but it, you, you would need to look further downstream to have those drops that get accelerated and spread out more. Uh, you can still see an effect on the velocity. So the droplet velocity uh, by default is a bit bimodal for the spray because the spray is spreading and there's less drops that have uh, zero velocity. And when you put the electric field with this radial acceleration, you strengthen this characteristic and get distribution with um, peaks that are further uh, and further away from zero and uh, with less and less probability of having a zero, zero radial dis uh, velocity on your spray. And you can see that quite clearly when you look at the radial acceleration of your droplets. So you see those PDF with white tails that get wider and wider as you increase the potential 
on your on your plate so when you increase the effective electrical force acting of your droplets that you somehow measure indirectly uh, by looking at the droplet radial acceleration. So uh, I will conclude here uh, by saying that we've characterized the uh, um, open loop actuation with the swirl being steady or modulated and how you can further use the electric field to redistribute uh, your droplet distribution and get something that tends to be more uniform. We need to study into more detail the uh, effect of the electric field, see how it differ from a drop of different size and how we can use that to do sorting, for instance. And um, our future work will be to um, work a bit more toward uh, the data analysis and the modeling uh, to uh, get like the model I presented in the introduction about the sodium in diameter, see if we can include the control, uh, like the swill and things like that, uh, as this would be very useful, uh, both for the fundamental understanding and for the implementation of the feedback control. And in parallel, we are uh, working toward trying to help uh, our colleagues that do numerical simulation uh, in for uh, validation. So I've showed you the simulation from Olivier Desjardins. We also work with uh, um, Balachanda at uh, U Florida um, that has a very interesting approach uh, to improve the modeling of uh, particle interaction uh, within, a, within a grid, um, within a grid, uh, the, the mesh of a grid uh, in a Julia Lagrange uh, simulation. So, thank you very much, and I will be happy to take any question. Either. Je l'avais éteint, tu l'as rallumé. Le swirl. Bon, on va sans. Euh, oui, le swirl, c'est au niveau du gaz que tu le mets. Oui. Est-ce que les gens essayent au niveau du liquide Oui, il y, y a toute une communauté qui fait du liquide swirlé. Euh, pour, euh, du coup, j'imagine que ça change assez fortement la, la couche limite euh, à l'interface liquide-gaz. Euh, nous, ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on qu a essayé de faire, parce qu'on a essayé de rester assez canonique euh, et euh, dans l'approche contrôle on a envie d'avoir quelque chose qui, euh, qui est modulable euh, par un incrément aussi petit qu'on veut. On, par exemple tu vois le swirl c'est très souvent il est mis par euh, en mettant des veines pour avoir quelque chose de très propre euh, et nous on n'est pas parti là dessus parce qu'on veut pouvoir euh, faire du feedback contrôle en real time euh, donc pas avoir à démonter l'atomizer pour adapter la population de gouttes. Tu vois. Il n'y a pas de retour. Ouais. Euh, ok, bah, ma question c'est euh, tes mesures de taille de goutte, je l'ai déjà posée ouais. en privé, mais euh, tes mesures de taille de goutte avec le PDPA, ouais. euh, quel euh, degré de de confiance tu as dans, dans ces mesures, euh, au petit, euh, petit rayon, grand rayon, euh, en proche, en champ proche, en champ lointain, etc. Du coup, là, tout ce que j'ai présenté aujourd'hui, c'est euh, des mesures euh, très loin. On est à au minimum 10 diamètres euh, du gaz. Euh, si tu préfères regarder en diamètre du liquide, euh, c'est une cinquantaine de diamètres. Euh, c'est vraiment une fois que la turbulence a fait subir l'atomisation secondaire aux gouttes euh, et du coup c'est des choses où on est, on est confiant qu'il n'y a pas de gouttes trop grandes qu'on ne mesure pas il n'y a pas de gouttes non sphériques qu'on ne mesure pas et aller dans la direction d'aller mesurer où c'est un peu plus euh, challenging euh, c'est quelque chose qui nous intéresse c'est quelque chose qu'on est en train de faire et là ce que je présente c'est uniquement les les données sur lesquelles on est confiant sur les mesures de taille de goutte.
Mais du coup, là, il y a, y a beaucoup de travail à faire pour euh, aller mesurer plus finement des choses à différents endroits où, où bah, tu as une partie du liquide qui n'est pas complètement atomisée et, euh, et où du coup, il faut, euh, faut voir comment mesurer avec euh, une combinaison de différentes techniques de mesure pour essayer de statistiquement représenter correctement ta population de gouttes. Et par exemple, euh, tes, tes distributions ont un pic autour de, ouais. de 20 microns. Ouais. Euh, est-ce que, est que ce pic est réel ou est-ce que ça pourrait être dû au fait qu'on ne capture pas euh, euh, des gouttes de taille plus petite que 20 microns Non, on, on capture typiquement euh, jusqu'au jusqu micron. Quoi Pardon, quoi, ouais. euh, du coup, 20 microns, c'est plutôt bon. Si le pic était à 2 microns, là, euh, si, si les distributions venaient... Euh, ne, ne redescendait jamais, je commencerai à douter, le fait qu'elle redescende, euh, quoi, le fait que le pic est bien au-delà de, de notre limite de résolution, permet d'être un peu plus confiant là-dessus. D'accord. À, à, à propos de, euh, du champ électrique, il mm -hmm. euh, y a de la modélisation avec le... Alors que, si oui, à quel euh, sur l'effet du champ électrique Alors, euh, sur euh, comment ça déstabilise le jet ou sur comment tu changes le transport euh, en champ lointain oui, Déjà sur le transport. Sur le transport, du coup, euh, euh, Balachandar, il, euh, il, il bosse... Euh, ça, c'est quelque chose qu'il met dans ses simulations au l'air Lagrange, euh, d'avoir euh, un potentiel électrique. Euh, du coup, tu as des gouttes qui ont une certaine taille, qui ont une certaine charge un potentiel électrique, du coup tu, tu peux avoir la force sur ta goutte. Euh, après il y a toutes les histoires d'écrantage, etc. Euh, qui, euh, je pense, quoi, sur lesquelles il va falloir faire des modélisations et voir en fonction des mesures expérimentales. De... Là ça demande de faire beaucoup plus de mesures pour pouvoir la PDF que j'ai présentée, euh, pouvoir la conditionner en fonction des tailles des gouttes la conditionner en fonction de est-ce que ma goutte est sur l'extérieur le du spray tout seul ou est-ce qu'elle est au centre euh, avec tout un nuage de gouttes euh, qu'on décharge autour d'elle qui produisent un, un champ électrique local donc là il y a beaucoup de travail à faire, à faire là-dessus euh, on a une bonne idée de dans quelle direction aller mais c'est une histoire de bon bah plutôt que faire quelques films pour chaque point de tout ce que je vous ai montré ici pour un peu explorer les contrôles bah va falloir euh, choisir un, quelque chose qui est représentatif de ce qui se passe et faire beaucoup de statistiques pour euh, bah avoir, avoir des, des PDF convergés, conditionnés à, à des choses un peu fines. Et, et sur le plan expérimental, c'est des, euh, des champs statiques là euh, Ouais, pour l'instant c'est statique. Euh, là j'aimerais bien euh, moduler euh, le champ, notamment le champ euh, à qui injecte les charges dans le jet. J'aimerais bien voir des modulations à la fréquence de flapping, notamment. J'ai vu pas mal de mesures où tu as juste un, un jet qui tombe, et tu lui mets un champ alternatif, et, et tu le fais flapper. Et tu produis des gouttes, et tu produis des ligaments, et des choses comme ça. Parce qu'inversement, tu pourrais essayer de contrecarrer le, le flapping. Ouais. Ouais, ouais, ouais. ouais. <rire> ce qui est peut-être un peu ce qui se passe avec le swirl modulé. Mais bon, faut rien. Ouais. J'avais la même fois une question un peu, enfin, reliée au champ électrique. Mm -hmm. est -ce, donc, est-ce que ça va dépendre beaucoup de l'ionisation des, 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 des gouttes mm -hmm. euh, Est-ce qu'on sait quelque chose parce que il faut mettre les, les conditions initiales, par exemple, même dans une simulation ouais. numérique Est-ce qu'on est qu qu est qu sait sur la manière dont c'est ionisé Et est-ce que ça dépend de la taille de la goutte euh Ce qu'on qu peut mesurer, c'est la, la densité de charge qu'on donne au liquide parce qu'on mesure le, le courant qui, qui part, euh, qui est très faible. Euh, et à partir de cette densité de charge, tu sais que tes charges migrent en surface. Du coup, tu, euh, tu peux savoir que j'avais tant de charges par euh, kilo. Euh, voilà, J'ai euh, ces populations de gouttes sur ces PDF. Et du coup, tu peux essayer de modéliser des PDF de densité de charge euh, dans ton spray. Je ne sais pas si ça répond à ta question. De la goutte, ouais. Ouais, ouais, bah ça dépend de la taille de la goutte parce que les charges ne sont qu'en surface, donc tu ne peux mettre qu'un certain nombre de charges. Tu as des critères. Euh... Les, les temps de migration des charges. 
sont beaucoup plus rapides que les temps de, migra de formation des gouttes. Donc j'aurais tendance à penser que euh, deux gouttes de même taille auront les mêmes charges. Après, c'est pas clair euh, comment les, euh, le processus d'atomisation qui est très multiscale à la fois spatialement et temporellement va redistribuer tes charges dans, dans ton jet. En, J'aurais envie de penser que quand ton champ électrique est euh, permanent et pas alterné, c'est une bonne approximation de penser que des gouttes de même taille ont la même charge. Mais mesurer la charge de gouttes individuelles, euh, ça c'est quelque chose que je ne sais pas comment en faire. Les, les vitesses typiques, c'est euh, euh, 20 mètres par seconde au minimum pour les gouttes. Okay. Est-ce qu'il y a encore d'autres questions Sinon, on te remercie.